Hello, I'm Rich Borden, and um, Sean wants me to tell you that I'm a human ecologist, but that's one of the things we'll figure out as we move along here. Uh, you may take notes on this, but uh, there, I have quite a number of slides, so the, the thing that's most important to me is you try to get the names of the people I'm talking about. I'm going to mention about a dozen or 13 people. Get those names. This talk uh, will be on YouTube or Vimeo or, you know, it'll be out there if you want to see it later on. So uh, take notes that you think are important, but we'll go from there. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is cover some uh, uh, intersections between uh, nature, mind, imagination, and human ecology. And I have sort of an outline that we'll look at first uh, questions of origins, where do things come from, how do they hang together, um, what kinds of minds are there, and how can we look at the world in small and larger ways. <clears throat> any of you, any of your families into genealogy? A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, okay. Well, my parents were into it. And I was named, uh, my sister and I were named Richard, I'm Richard, she's Joan, uh, after the first Richard and Joan that came to North America in the 1630s. And so I've got that piece in there, and, and my mother did a lot more, and my sister's done a lot, lot more. And she found out that my name has repeated itself uh, through uh, the Borden family, uh, and she traced it all the way back to England, eastern England, um, in uh, and we went there. My wife and I were, did, took a little trip. There was a human ecology conference last year. And she was looking at some of her family history in, uh, in Devon and in Cornwall. And then we went over to East Anglia and, and, and went to this church. And this church has a grave uh, beside it of a Richard Borden, of whom I'm r related, I guess. And we went and we saw the vicar. And, and it's, that was sort of cool. But it only lasted a little while. Turns out the town is actually named Borden. And it has about nine houses and one pub. So we ate lunch at that pub there. We were the only people. Uh, and we told them we were Bordens. And they say, we see a lot of you guys. I anyhow, uh, while I was sitting there, um, my wife says, what else would you like to do this afternoon? And, and my wife is a psychotherapist. And one of the nice things about being a psychotherapist is that they often know what you want before you do. So she said to me, get in the car. And, we, and we're going to go visit somebody. We got in the car and we went over to this, this house. And I rang the doorbell. And the person who lives there wasn't there. And that's who it is, or that's who it was. You know who that was? Is? You know the house? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> no, uh, it's Charles Darwin's house. That's Down House. And we went on a day when there was nobody there, and they let us in. My, my wife's sort of a pretty serious photographer, and she's got some high-end photography equipment that you're not allowed to use, but she did. And this is a picture of his study, where he actually wrote uh, Origin of the Species and a number of the other books that followed it. And this is a photo of his notebook from the Beagle, from his around-the-world trip where he did the first expedition. And if you look at that closely, I think you can see it says, I think. And then he shows that diagram. That's the first diagram of what is, we now call the tree of life. It's the only thing that appears in the origin of the species. And basically what he was getting at, and one of the, I think probably the first person to really get at it in, in a serious kind of way, is that, that all of life comes from a sing, single origin. All of life, us, everything else, are descendants of a single time when life began, and that somehow or other we are all connected together in this giant tree of life. And his idea of descent with modification really transformed the way we looked at the living world. And basically, it's this, the solid foundation of what we now know as evolutionary theory or evolutionary biology. What he said, and this is a short line from the origin, he said, we are all netted together. And when he said we are all netted together, he meant we are all netted together in time. We're all descendants of, of the primordial life. And just a few years after he did that, a German biologist, Ernst Haeckel, said there's another way to look at this, too. And he coined the word ecology. And ecology, in Haeckel's 
view is to look at the interactions of things in the here and now, the relationship between the living things here and now, not so much looking backwards where they came from, but what's going on around here right now. So on this sort of notion of strings and things, evolutionary things are organisms, individual organisms that can be classified into species. I think you know all the stuff that then fit into genus and higher, higher orders, family order, class, phylum, and so on. And that it all connects together in this very big phylogenetic tree of life. And that's basically what Darwin's uh, insight was. And the ultimate string that hangs or holds all these things together is DNA. And DNA that we have in us now is the exact same DNA that was the first DNA that was somehow or other cooked up in the soup four, four and a half billion years ago. The basic underlying code structure is the same. It's gotten more complicated, but the DNA is still the same kind of DNA. And, and it has carried itself or reproduced itself all the way through. And the first, uh, not long after the Earth itself was formed, uh, the DNA created a code to create basically little bags of, of chemicals. I mean, these, were, these are called prokaryote cells. Prokaryote cells are very, very simple, uh, but they can reproduce themselves, usually asexually. And, and uh, basically, prokaryote cells of that period were anaerobic bacteria. When I say anaerobic bacteria, they, they took in carbon dioxide and they emitted oxygen. And they did it for two billion years. And in that two billion years, they changed the world. They oxygenated the ocean, which is where they were. And then that percolated out and it, it created the atmosphere. And it basically, in many ways, they killed themselves off in the same way that anaerobic bacteria kill themselves off when you make beer or wine. Um, some of them figured out a way to eat each other. And, and, uh, and they ingested parts of each other. And, and the more complex cell that came about two billion years ago are eukaryotes, which contain features of the prokaryotes. And these are the, the more complex cells that, of which we are a part. And, and uh, the eukaryotes invented a number of things. They invented sexual reproduction. They invented mobility. Um, they invented multicellularity. And, uh, and they invented movement. And, and the simple forms of multicellularity were to create filaments or thin sheets or big blobs like that sponge there. And they also figured out how to arrange themselves into a sphere. And this is a major breakthrough in evolution. And the sphere, if you look at the top right-hand one there, those blastospheres had a way of folding in on themselves, which is called invagination. And if it went all the way through to the other side and created a hole all the way through, that's called gastrulation. And that creates a tubal structure where the environment is not just outside of you. The environment is now passing through the middle of it. And basically, that's a worm. And on the bottom left is a, a crude structure of, uh, of an ancient uh, protochordate. Chordates are organisms that have spinal cords. And these base simple worm-like structures uh, really expanded in the Cambrian period about 550 million years ago. And that little unit there on the bottom right is called a picaya. It was found in the Burgess Shale of northwest Canada about 100 years ago. And it is believed to be, as close as we know, to the common ancestor of all the animals to above it there. It goes from, well, worms and into eels and then into the soft uh, fish like sharks, into the bony fish, into um, reptiles, and then tetrapods and amphibians, and then up onto land uh, into reptiles. Did I say reptiles yet? Bony fish, amphibians, reptiles, then ultimately into mammals. And uh, at about the time the dinosaurs went extinct, for reasons we all know with asteroids and so on, about 65 million years ago, there were some mammals around, little ones, 
they made it through the mass extinction. The one on the bottom there is a, a characterization of what we think is our ancestor through that period. Um, it is some kind of, or it was, it's gone, some kind of a nocturnal um, insectivore. Uh, it was arboreal. It lived in trees, it ate bugs, and did it mostly at night. And that, la that, that later evolved into uh, the New World and the Old World monkeys, and then into, the, into baboons and apes and chimps, and, and then to us. So that's a way to talk about evolutionary things, or some kind of a background. If we want to talk about ecological things, we remember Heckel now. Heckel turns our attention to the present, to the here and now. So how do we look at ecology, or how do ecologists look at ecology? And they basically look at it in two ways. They look at it in a sort of a big picture way, which is sometimes called sin ecology. And depending on how big you make the frame, you can either put the whole world in it, in which case we're looking at the biosphere ecologically, or it might be smaller regions of the world, which are sometimes called biomes, or watersheds, or islands, or lakes, or reefs, or forests, or so on and so on. And the, and the language of this kind of ecology is basically to look for webs, or connections, or pyramids, and, and things like that. So you often see it characterized, or it's often studied as food chains, because a lot of what's going on here is something's eating something else, or energy flow through these various different kinds of systems, whatever they happen to be. And this is sort of the systems, or what's called the ecosystems view. And to break that apart a little bit, um, it's off, often characterized that there are organisms lower on the food chain. They're eaten by ones further up and up and up. So you got primary producers and then consumers, and then you have decomposers like microbial life that breaks it all back down again. So on the bottom right there, you would see something that looks like plants and, and herbivores and carnivores. Now in certain systems, let's call them. It can be much more complicated than that. You might have as many as a dozen levels, and they're working sideways, and little things are eating big things. It's not, it's, it's very, very complicated. Another way to look at ecology is to look at a specific organism, a species, maybe an actual individual, but in most cases, people focus on a species, and, and look at the life history or the actual, all the interactions that that particular organism has with its living and its abiotic environment. So on the top left is a pelican. And a pel pelican was the dissertation species for John Anderson, I think, if I'm not mistaken. In the middle there on the top is a snake, and I'm pretty sure that's what Steve Russell focused on. Uh, on the top right is, that's actually a rare photograph of a rare plant in Acadia National Park. It's Iris hookeri. And I think there's probably only two people around who know where that plant is, and Nishi is one of them. These are protected, so protected that they're cataloged. We, ha we have the catalog, but the public can't know where they are. This was actually uh, one of the study subjects that Craig Green, who preceded Nishi, studied. The next thing over there on the left is sort of a, is that an arthropod? Is krill an arthropod? Uh, yes. OK, that's an arthropod. What? Crustacean. It's a crustacean, OK. So is, uh, is krill, which is a little tiny marine organism, that was the dissertation subject matter for Steve Katona, who was a faculty, one of the first faculty members here and then a president. After he got to Maine, he lost his interest in uh, krill, and he got interested in the thing that eats krill, which is whales, and that's what Sean does. And so anyhow, the, the list goes on, but there's a kind of ecology where you take a particular organism and you really understand how that lives. And how it may play into uh, the future. So here's one of the names I would like you to, I'm giving you a winter reading list. When it's cold here and it's dark, and it's really dark and cold here in the winter, and, and you have nothing to do at night except eat popcorn, read these books. These, I, these are, in fact, I would love to have a reading group to read these books at some point. Aldo Leopold was a very influential essayist. He wrote a lot of things. He was also a range manager and, and a, a really one of the first applied ecologists. Taught at the University of Wisconsin, among other places. And this is his way of saying it, that ecology is a science that attempts the feat of thinking in a plane perpendicular to Darwin. And it goes sort of like this. Evolution looks at time, 
changes through time, what is sometimes called diachronic, like history is diachronic. You look at the patterns in time. Whereas ecology looks for the patterns in the here and now. That's, by contrast, called synchronic, right? To look at the, at the pattern. So there are two forms of perception that really go together. And that's what Leopold was trying to get at. And he developed this in a much more complicated way and developed a whole set of uh, ethical ideas that derive from it, which is another interesting thing. Anyhow, this gets us to, I guess, the subject matter of this subject, which is human ecology. And In some ways, human ecology is a kind of autoecology. We're looking at one species now. Instead of looking at whales or bumblebees or something, we're looking at ourselves. But we're a pretty complicated um, uh, creature. And um, there are, or there were, or there have been, I think at least six or seven species of uh, uh, species in the genus Homo. And up there, you see on this, this sort of characterizes when they, when they lived, where they lived. And if you follow that up, what you'll see is Homo sapiens. That's us. We're the only ones left. Um, there's some question marks about what we, what we might have done to the Neanderthals when we lived together in Europe. But the hypothesis is we did them in and then took it over. And this little map over here shows approximately the time and the pathway of Homo sapiens as they left Africa about 65,000 years ago. And they moved up across into Europe, across Asia, down into Australia, up across into the north. This doesn't show them crossing the Bering Strait, coming down into North and South America. But by about 15,000 years ago, humans had put themselves all over the world. right? And in many ways, we have captured the world. Um, I don't know how many billion, what are we, six and a half billion now? So in just 65,000 years, we've gone from, there was just a few hundred Homo sapiens that went out, out of Africa into, into Asia. And now we're at six and a half billion. So we've won the game. The kind of human ecology, I'm giving you a little sort of the background of human ecology. The human ecology we really need to be concerned about is the human ecology of the future. What are we going to do? with what we just took. So um, what makes humans especially distinctive is our imagination. And we're very inventive. And this is where the mind comes in. A lot of the things that um, we have, by which we have changed the world, have come out of our mind. They've come out of our capacity to, to envision new kinds of things. And they range from simple technologies of fishing and hunting uh, to art to religion to uh, agriculture, architecture, civilizations. And um, up down in the bottom right, you can sort of get the picture of where we're headed. Um, and, it, and, and it does raise questions. Do we want to rethink or can we rethink our way past the adaptations that got us to where we are? are probably not the adaptations we need to make the future livable. And that's a lot of what we're trying to bring into consciousness, I think, with the study of human ecology. These are two of my, no, they're actually my two favorite human ecologists. Uh, Paul Shepard uh, wrote a book in the, back in the 1970s called Ecology, the Subversive Science. And that book, the premise of that book was that once we, or as we start to study ecology, we are going to learn things about our, we are going to learn things about the world that are going to teach us about ourselves. And, and in many ways, they're going to raise questions that are going to challenge us in the way that we answer them. If you read, any of you read the John Bisvader essay yet? He's, he's getting at that in there. He's talking about once somebody tells you that the phosphates you're using to clean your blue jeans is killing the fish in the lake, you either got to learn how to repress that thing that you have in your mind, or if you've got to come to terms with it. That's sort of, so the, what, what Shepard was, was saying is that, that ecology is going to be psychologically really significant to us. And, and the little quote there, the central problem of human ecology, as he said back then, 
is, is basically the, the problem of the relationship between mind and nature. Um, let me say this a little differently. When the environmental movement started in the 1970s, the question was, can the, can the earth absorb humans? It was sort of like a question of carrying capacity. Slowly over time, that has turned more inward for us. And the question is more becoming, can human consciousness comprehend its relationship with the living world? Do you feel the difference, right? It, that more of it's coming more in, it's becoming more of an interior. It's becoming a more human question. And again, if you look at, I think the essay that, I, that we passed out from Bill Carpenter, where he's, he's talking about the interior world there, and he's sort of comparing science and art, and, but he's really talking about what, what many of the things we need to do have to do with insight and changing our, our awareness. Another uh, important author uh, for me, and I think for a lot of other people, uh, was Gregory Bateson. Anybody ever hear of Bateson? No? This would be, I'll, I'll, if you take a class with me, maybe we'll read some of his stuff. It's really hard, but it's, it's really important stuff. And, and Bateson is a, a complex thinker. Um, he, is a, he comes from, from an extraordinary background. His father actually discovered Gregor Mendel's work on genetics with peas. Do you know that sort of study? You know who Mendel was? Right? Nobody knew that stuff. Darwin didn't know about gen gen genes at all. He had no idea how that, this, these things worked. Uh, Bateson's father discovered Mendel's work and made it public, and it cr created a great new revolution in evolutionary biology when, when Gregory was, the, was a boy. And he later on married a famous anthropologist by the name of Margaret Mead, you may have heard of. So anyhow, interesting life. I have his lectures. I still, I still walk around Eagle Lake sometimes and listen to his lectures. I've got about 50 hours of them. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about mind, kinds of minds or something like that. And uh, this is just a thought that comes from Darwin. Darwin uh, was sometimes frustrated by his colleagues, uh, biologists, who had a tendency, he found, to either fall into one of two groups. They either found, in a, in a group of, of 40 specimens, they would find 20 species. Those were splitters. And others who would be lumpers, and they'd put great, all things that really didn't belong together. Into, and so he, he recognized that. Not only is there variability in the, in the biological world, there's a lot of variability in the human world with, within and between individuals. And that, the study of that and the study of the mind has created its own field, which is called psychology, which is my background and your background, at least. From the, we've grown out of that now. Yeah. We wear bigger shoes, I guess. So I want to say a little bit about psychology. And this is very simple, but I, just to make a, a comparison, psychology, like ecology, has sort of two ends to the way it looks at the world. On one end, like synecology, you know, big ecology, psychology looks at it through what is called a nomothetic frame. What that simply means is big theories. And it tries to come up with very large theories. So you look at theories like psychoanalysis or behaviorism or scientific psychology or humanistic psychology or trans these are very big things where you try to understand human nature in a, in a really comprehensive way and then within that sort of theoretical structure you try to be try to explain how it is that people are different or how mind works or something like that the other end of the spectrum is what is sometimes called ideographic and that is a self picture as the word implies and this is this draws a frame down to the thing that the psychologist is looking at is just one person, you. So my wife, the psychotherapist, doesn't have a lot of theoretical crap going on in her head when she's sitting with one of her clients. The whole thing, the, uh, every bit of the story is that person right there. That's taking that very specific. So you see the range of things. So sort of psychology sort of lays in, in between all those things. Now, this is a, this is a little game. Um, there are two premises there, two pr propositions, one that you might call a major premise and a minor premise. And what conclusion would you draw from that? What? Socrates dies. Socrates dies. Good. Get rid of that guy. Okay. And, and what you have done is what is called in philosophy, in logic, a, you've used a syllogism. 
It's actually, it's actually a very particular syllogism called syllogism in Barbara because there are 256 syllogisms in logic that are named after different things. That one's the primal one. And the word Barbara is used because it has A, A, A in the word Barbara, and that's how you remember it. It's a detail. Anyhow, this is one of the basic tools of deduction in, in logical philosophy. Okay? Here's another one. Grass dies. Humans die. Help me out. Huh? Humans are grass. Humans are grass. How do you, what do you think? I love it. Yeah. That's to reason, that's called, philosophers hate it. It's called affirming the consequence. But it's actually reasoning by analogy rather than logic. And it is exactly what psychology is about. Because psychology picks up where philosophers and logic lead off, leave off. The truth is human beings aren't logical. If they were, they'd be like computers and they'd have no emotions and the answers would always come out that way. They'd be highly predictable. We're totally unpredictable, not totally, largely unpredictable. We're crazy emotional and we've got all this other sort of stuff and we don't reason logically. We reason analogically or metaphorically. So here's a line, famous, a line from a very famous poem by Walt Whitman. Elmer, what's that poem? What's the name of that poem? from leaves of grass. And what he's basically saying is, when I die, look for me, I am the grass. And that's what poetry is doing. Poetry is extending metaphor. It's extending the mind, if you will, out into the world, not by logical analysis, but by this sort of leap of an analogy, by this leap of uses of simile, of like or as, or by metaphorical extension. And Aristotle recognized this. Aristotle is, is a terrific philosopher, and, and that's another person that's, who's worth spending a little time with, uh, with your popcorn, um, or in my class. Uh, and, and, and Aristotle re realized that, that humans reason using metaphor all the time, and we do, we do it all the time. If you just go through ecology, ecology, if you go through anything, I don't care what it is, scientists even fill up their theories with metaphor. So do you, I think, if, did you get the paper by John Anderson? We're talking about umbrella species and flagships and keystones and stuff like that. And we've got webs of life, life and balances of nature and all kinds of things. I mean, even Kepler, when he came up with some ideas about the solar system and how the planets moved, uh, metaphorized it by music. And the name of his book was called Harmonicus Mundi because he thought that the intervals between the planets going out from the sun were the same as the interval, intervals in the notes of a scale. So we, we metaphorize all the time. <clears throat> okay, shift gear. This is my front yard. I don't use fertilizer. Right. <laughs> Did anybody notice anything there? Notice anything yet? Anybody notice anything yet? Yeah? How about now? Anything? Who's, who said that? Looks like a what? A face. Yeah. I walked out one morning. And I was just, I was back here. There. And I'm walking. And all of a sudden, do you, can you see it yet there? Yeah. Then, but once I saw it, I could not not see it anymore. And then once you see it, you can, you can find it all the way back. I thought that was really cool. So I went back and I got my camera. And it's now gone because who knows, I ran over with a lawnmower. Uh, but what I, what I want to use that for is to, sh to begin to show how our mind is active. Right? And there, once you see the face, what, what's happening is there's no face in that rock, I don't think. But my mind is projecting itself onto and is grasping. It's making meaning out of some kind of pattern of things that's going on out there. And here's a little collection of those um, that I dredged up. The one on the top left, the, the Jesus and the grilled cheese sandwich sold on eBay. I don't know for how much. I think it was $15,000. Somebody sold it on, on eBay. And uh, what else is in there? I guess the tree one on the bottom left is supposed to be Elvis. The one in the middle on the bottom is... Uh, 
from a photograph of Mars. And then the one on the right is a controversial one that came out of the CNN film tapes of 9-11 of the smoke coming out of the tower. And do you see it? Some people, well, it doesn't, you have to be darker. Can anybody see it? Yeah. Can you see it? It was interpreted as the face of the devil, right, or something like that. Okay. That phenomenon is called pareidolia, uh, to see faces all over the place. And it all happens to be a sign of schizophrenia, too, just to make you think a little bit. <laughs> but uh, but it, we, we have a recognition pattern for faces. It's, it's very clear that infants, immediately upon being born, somehow or other can tune into the face, and they, they lock onto their mother's face. So we've got this thing sort of built into us. And it's a way of, it's a, it's a form of projection or, or of grasping or making meaning. But it doesn't have to be only faces. It can be all sorts of things. And uh, this is broader category is called apophenia. And uh, we all do this in different ways. Can you see what they are? The top one, what is it? Teddy bear. Huh? Teddy bear? OK, and this one? OK, and then, of course, people have been looking at the stars and making up stories for 15,000 years. We project it onto there. And you, you can't, once you know a constellation, it's almost like you can't look at the stars again anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like, there it is. Like, once you know what the Big Dipper looks like, you can't seem to erase it from your experience. And, and this phenomena has other names. Um, sometimes it's called false positives, where you see something that isn't there and you act on believing that it's there. Or sometimes it's called false alarms. Or statistics is called type 1 error, right? right? And, and, and so and I, I, has anybody ever had the experience of, of being in the shower and you think the phone rang? Do you know that one? There's a new thing I just heard that's associated with the internet of people believing that their cell phone is vibrating in their pocket when it's not. And not only that, they think it's vibrating in their pocket when the cell phone isn't even in their pocket. Have you had the experience? I had it in sitting in ACM a little while ago, because you know, I was waiting for a phone call from my son. I, I text, do you see me text him? And, but I put, the thing in, I put the thing in my briefcase. And I was sitting there waiting for him to come back, and I was expecting him to vibrate. I thought for sure it vibrated. It wasn't there. So anyhow, so you've seen these things in all different kinds of forms. And uh, the reason I put these up here there, because they, they're a juxtaposition, because it allows you to actually feel the tension of holding two imaginal representations together. And you usually can't see them at the same time. You tend to see one or the other. You know, you can feel your mind jumping back and forth between them. Everybody sees both of those, right? OK, those are, those are pretty straight ahead ones. So here we go. I've got, got a question for you. What is that? It's a very short ladder. No. What is that? Yeah, I mean, my, my, what I'm driving at is it, it depends. Your mind will tell you what it is depending on the context in which you in which it's embedded. So there, it's a, yeah, it's easy. It's immediately we know what that is. But over there, do you feel the change? OK. So that's the kind of contextualism that you feel those pulls. All right. So let me try something else for a second. I've got to find myself. Is that, how's the light in here? If I, if I go up here, there's a little sunlight right there. I need your help. Where's that sunlight coming in? How's that? Who is it? Who? Marilyn Monroe? OK. Anouk, come up here. Take this, don't say anything. Take that and show it to those people up there. All right, and I'll show this to you guys down here. That really, I should have left one out here. Does that really look like Marilyn Monroe? It does, doesn't it? Does? Yes? You get it? 
You get it? Yeah. Okay, just pass it around. Oh, my God. Okay. Now, this is really getting a will Bill Carpenter's getting out about. This is why Bill Carpenter went and bought his Hawkeye camera to go out and take the picture, because his dad was messing around with paintings, and Bill wanted to have the truth. So what is the truth here? The image didn't change. But if you take that, and you can have it and play with it. But if, if you take that, it, there's a really interesting thing, the experience of when it goes from, that's clearly Marilyn Monroe. You can see 50 of them. It's a, who's, who's the painter? Andy Warhol, who did all those faces. And then you walk up to it, and then all of a sudden, it's something, you can feel your mind changed, being changed. That's what I'm trying to get us into. Okay. So what is that? It's a deer. Is it a male or a female? And what are they called? Cool. And what are those? Mittens. OK, any confusion? Well, Elmer, you might know this story. A few years ago in the newspaper, actually I heard it on the radio, there was a young mother up near Bangor in a little town called Herman who went out on her front porch and put on her white mittens. Stepped off the porch, stepped into the front yard, and she was shot dead. Right? The guy who shot her was a deer hunter. He was the grocery manager for Doug's Shop and Save, of a respected community member. He was a Boy Scout leader. He'd been a hunter all his life. He really knew what he was doing. He was, he was a safe hunter and all those kinds of things. But he shot her, and he shot her twice. And he shot her with a 306, which if you don't know about guns, that's a bolt action gun. Right? You have to shoot, reload, shoot again, and he had a scope. He was 200 feet away from her, shot her twice, and he was so sure that she was a, a buck, because he did not have a doe permit. He had not only know that she white, he had to know that it had horns and be. You got the thing? He saw what he, he, saw what he wanted to see, and he saw a buck deer twice through a scope, shot it, ran up to her, she was dead. Well, he was devastated. I mean, he really was devastated. Because, and, and the long, the short version of this story is, well, she was dead. But, but when it went to the grand jury, the grand jury acquitted him of negligence because they really believed that what he thought he saw was the buck. Right? That's a really strange case. I mean, I, for me, I, it's, it, cause, so what's the truth here? The truth that they took to be the ultimate truth, in terms of whether it was a crime or not, was he was, convi he was convincing that he was convinced that he didn't know what he had shot, that the image that he was holding in his head was so strong. That's where I'm trying to get a little bit closer to beliefs and belief systems. Okay. Uh, I just like this because it's so creepy. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, uh, when I'm talking about mind, uh, this image of somebody peeping through a peephole at you, the reason it's creepy is because that person has a mind, and you don't know what's going on in their mind, but it's probably not a good thing. And, 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 the, and the alternative, the, or the test of that is, aren't we happy that trees don't have minds? What would it be like walking home at night with the trees up there, you know? <laughs> It would be like a, a, a Walt Disney movie, you know, all of a sudden the tree's going to grab you and stuff like that. Mind is, is a complicated thing because a lot of the ways it works is invisible. But that's, doesn't, that's not really why I picked that picture. Um, I'll get to that, why I picked it in a second. What I really want to talk about is, uh, is, uh, is the idea of, of essay. And you all have been reading some essays by faculty members. You know that somewhere down the road three and a half, four years from now, you're going to have to write a human ecology essay. So I thought it raised the question of what is an essay. An essay, the word comes from old French for essay, which means to try or to attempt to do something. Um, and it's akin to the English word assay. If you were um, a panning for gold out in California in the 1850s, at the end of the day, you would take your gold nuggets and dust into the assay office, and they would weigh it. Those are those. But really, the, what it has come to mean, generally, is a brief, personal, speculative view of the world. And uh, Aldous Huxley said, an essay is like looking at the world through a keyhole. 
and I'll leave that. I've got another thought, but I'll bring it up later. Here we go. Anybody, anybody know who that is? This will be a stretch for you. But I'll give you an A in the course if you, if you know who it is. Uh, all right, time's up. <laughs> Edward R. Murrow. Any, anybody ever hear, hear of Edward R. Murrow? Edward R. Murrow is, was the this, this sort of dean of American broadcasting. After World War II, when commercial radio was really big and then television came in, Edward R. Murrow was um, a broad, first he did it on radio. He, he, he introduced the essay. And, and now we have them all the time. You see 60 Minutes or Frontline or all those kinds of things. But before that, the only thing that they did on radio uh, was sort of goofy uh, entertainment shows, sort of, you know, The Lone Ranger and Leave it to Beaver and stuff like that, or news. And what Edward R. Murrow did was he introduced the radio essay. And, and what he did is he asked a number of famous people in that time period, this would have been the 50s, he asked Einstein, he asked Helen Keller, he asked Eleanor Roosevelt and people like that to write a simple, short essay. And the, the topic of the essay should be this, I believe. Just try to write an essay, essay about what you believe. And then these were read on the radio, and he also had regular audience members submit them, and he would select some of those and read them. And it was a very, very popular show. He then went on into television and started to do these things in television. And he got into, it was very controversial. He did one called Harvest of Shame, which was about uh, migrant workers, which really was way ahead of the curve. And he, and he also did some essays about an era of a red scare during the 50s when Joe McCarthy was doing all the stuff that he was doing with the John Birch Society. Anyhow, 50 years later, I think about 2005, National Public Radio revived it, and they asked, again, some famous people to write a short 1,000 words, something like that, essay called This I Believe. And, and some of those were read. You probably heard, have heard some of them. They did them on Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and stuff on public radio. And they also invited people to submit them. And over 80,000 people wrote them, and if it was selected, they came to your house or whatever, some, somehow arranged it so that you could read your essay and they were on, on the radio. This is an idea, they had Bill Gates, was, is, is, this, this is a book, you can, it's down at uh, Sherman's. Bill Gates did it and Isabel Allende and Martha Graham and a lot of famous people, but all other, and these are just terrific little essays. And I think what we're, are we talking about doing something along these lines for, for the next assignment? to try your hand at writing a simple essay. Don't worry about the human ecology thing or the meaning of the whole damn world. Just take a, a brief time and reflect on yourself and say, this is what I believe. And I'll tell you how to get at this, or a way to get at this. Elmer and I, years ago, used to teach traditional music here. He's a guitar player and he's a terrific songwriter. Has some good albums and I used to peck around on various things. And we taught a music course one year and, and uh, there's a a folk singer from Maine. Um, actually, he's doing a concert this weekend up at Husson College. His name is David Mallett. Anybody ever hear of him? Anybody from Maine know who Dave Mallett is? He wrote a f Mallett. He wrote a, the garden song, inch by inch, row by row, going to make this garden grow. It's, it's even they even did it on Sesame Street, I think. And he he wrote he wrote a lot of other ones that I, I really liked a lot. And there was one that was very touching because I grew up on a farm, and and when he was a young kid. Um, he, he, he was from Dover Foxcroft, and he lived in the kind of farm where you had the f main house, back house, or main house, middle house, back house, barn, and they're all hooked together. There's still some of them around. Well, lightning hit the chicken house on a, in the middle of the summer, and the, it goes out of control in the barn, had hay in it and everything. Anyhow, every, he watched the whole thing burn down as a child, and he wrote this song about it. It's called Fire. And in it is a line about running into the house to save whatever it is that's most important to you. And this sort of is a sense of you don't have a lot of time to think about this, or you don't need a lot of time to think about it. You know what you want to save. And when this college burned down in 1983, a lot of us came here, and the, half the building was gone. It was on fire. And we started going in and out of windows and whatever we could to take, save whatever we could. Guess what we saved? Peace. 
Hmm? Books. You know what, 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 what we, people really went for? We saved the senior projects. Is that, I mean, it's, anyhow, the point was it was pretty cool. We don't need that leather chair to hell with that. We, you didn't have much time, so we pulled these kinds of things out. Think about this little thing along those lines. Just say very quickly right now, it's like, like I'm St. Peter, and here's heaven over here. And you're coming up and, and you say, I, 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 can I get in? And I say, well, what do you got to say? You got it one minute. Get, get an elevator speech. Give it to me quick. Do something along those lines. But try to put words around your own personal belief. Does that make sense? It's clear? OK, we'll try something like that. All right. So um, you read one of those that I did shortly after I came to the college. There's one of those essays. Um, this is another one. And I, I was, as I was putting the slides together for this essay, or this talk today, I was thinking, well, you know, this is sort of a human ecology essay. And I was looking at the slides, I was going through them backwards, and I, I realized that it doesn't matter if I gave this talk forward or backwards. You know, because I, I, when, I when I got to the end, I could just as easily have started there and tell, just tell the story the other way, because whatever is in the middle is, is what's, what I'm trying to get at. And so here, in my keyhole version of it, is a simple sketch of what I'm trying to get at. I believe three things. I believe there are three worlds, that we live in three worlds, if I have to keep it simple. And one of them is the living world. I really think it's out there. I'm not a skeptic. I really think evolution has happened pretty much the way I've been describing it. I really think there's an ecology of living things out there. And it's changing. I, that's, I take that to be, as they say in the, const, in the Declaration of Independence, self-evident. Right? I also think there's a second world, which I'll call the world of the mind. And it's different. It may have come from the living world. But the world of the mind is different. Psychology really is different from what biologists do. And nonetheless, these are connected to each other in, in a number of different kinds of ways. They're not completely alien. They are connected. And the third world, or they are, or they are connected through a third world that has to do with thought, has to do with language, has to do with feelings, has to do with perception, has to do with the kinds of things, the images I was showing you, where, you, where your mind goes at the world and it makes meaning or it discloses meaning or you see some kind of a pattern and then you invent a word for it. So this is basically what I'm getting at. This is the core structure. If I have to say this is what I believe now, this is where I would put my feet down and say I have this sort of three-world hypothesis. And if I, I need to make sense out of these worlds more or less separately, but also all together. Um, and if we, I, try to look at them all together, I'm, tr I'm also trying to move away from just looking at the world through the keyhole, because I'm trying to get into a bigger vision. I'm, I'm trying to, if you will, open the door, not just look through the keyhole. And Ken introduced us to Alfred North Whitehead. Um, you had a couple of his quotes, I think, in your thing. And Alfred North Whitehead, some people will say, may have been the greatest or one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. Um, he, he, early in his life, um, he did a major work on mathematics with Bertrand Russell called Mathematica Principia. Um, he was he's British. He left there and came to Harvard. And in, at Harvard, he worked for many, many years and developed a, a, a very complicated kind of philosophy called process philosophy. And um, uh, just before he died, he was invited to publish a collected work, or, or publish his collective works, in something called the Library of Living Philosophers where his works would be put together and then he would be able to comment on them before he was dead. You know, Plato's gone. We don't know what Plato thought about it. He said, Plato might have said, well, that was a really dumb idea. I wish you don't pay any attention to that one. I didn't really mean it. Well, this was a chance for a living philosopher to, to comment on his work. And he did. And he was, he was just before he died. And he, he wrote a letter, handwritten letter. And the publisher had the foresight to include a facsimile of that letter in the book. And in that letter, and it's not a long letter, it's a page and a half, this is what he said. He said that progress in philosophy is not about agreements or disagreements. It's about the enlargement of thought and, and in, in which things are transformed into wider points of view. 
I like that concept. That's the expansion of the keyhole thing. And what, this is something that Whitehead uh, really did. Um, other people who did it, actually Whitehead did it in the world of the mind. He started from the mind, then he invented a language. And if you ever read Whitehead, his language is really difficult because it's an entirely new language. You have to learn the language to understand what he's really getting at. What he's really getting at is how the, the world works. So he starts from the mind, creates a new philosophical language, and reframes the world. Rachel Carson sort of went the other way around. People know who she is? Heard of her? Okay. She wrote a number of very important books. She's primarily a biologist. The Sea Around Us was a very influential bestseller, and it was followed by what some people, or what uh, has been voted to be the most influential book of the 20th century, Silent Spring. <clears throat> and Silent Spring was based on science, but it went way beyond science because she didn't just describe what was happening to birds and um, talk about how pesticides were creating problems and teach us the ecology. She also carried the, the, the meaning of that and showed that not only did she know about birds, not only she, did she know about life, she loved birds and she loved life. So she allowed the feelings to be, a, the feelings of poet, if you will, be a part of her writing. So she went from biology and then used words in a really different kind of way and then, and then got to very strong human emotions. And that book was really influential. It was not like a dry science book. It opened people's hearts in a really different, that's a wide point of view. Annie Dillard is one of my favorite writers. She lives in the world of writer, writing. She wrote Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek. And, and, and she, one of her really interesting books for me is, is called The Writer's Life. And it's about what it's like to be a writer and how you create from that place, from the world of language. But she goes out in both of those directions and she says, <coughs> the universe is real. It's not an imaginal thing. It's really there, the sort of thing I'm trying to say. But at the same time, the world also is changed by advancing of thought. And it's from the mind. And these are, I would say, sort of broad, big vision uh, human ecology writers. Um, one more thing about Whitehead. In addition to his philosophy and, and his math and all those other things, he also wrote about education. And he wrote, a very, he wrote a small book, but a very influential book called The Aims of Education. And in, the, in that book, he defined the aim of education as being the acquisition of the art of utilization of knowledge. If you read it backwards, utilization using knowledge is an art. It's an art to know how to use knowledge. Acquisition of that art, developing that art, is what education ought to be about. Anybody recognize him? Did you come to convocation? How many came to convocation? Okay. He was the person we gave that glass, whatever thing was, flower vase to. Zed Calver, he was the founding president of this college. For, in the beginning, he was the only one here. And without him having been here, we, none of us would be here. And Ed um, was a real fan of Alfred North Whitehead. And when I came here, the college was quite small then, there was never a time that Ed stood up to give a talk in the all-college meeting in those days where he did not quote Whitehead. Because he, he, he basically said what this college is about is about the acquisition of the art of the utilization of knowledge. Right? Because he, he loved that. There was something beautiful in that. And he said, that's the core idea that we really want to get at here. And he wrote a human ecology essay, too. Actually, he wrote it one evening when he was a little annoyed following a faculty meeting where there was a long debate among some of the faculty about human ecology. And finally, he went home and he wrote out this short two-page thing about what he thought. And this is one of the, the cleanest thoughts I have seen. And this is really why I came and, and why, I, why I stay here, why I do what I do here. He says human ecology is a perspective. Human ecology, what he's saying, is a way of looking at the world. right? Uh, and it's, it, what we're really trying to do is to put knowledge back together of relating the disciplines that have been taken apart and make that knowledge useful for the future of the world. So anyhow, that's it. I think those are pretty close to my final thoughts. 
Um, the difference, I think, for you all is when I was talking about the keyhole, in most colleges, the keyhole that people look through is the keyhole of a discipline. You, maybe you become a chemist and you study chemistry, you study biology, you study. Here, the keyhole is different. The keyhole is for you to figure out what you actually want to look at. You've got to invent that vision. And that's partly why I think we want to have this little essay and have the human ecology essay and why you get a chance to create your own curriculum and all that stuff. And the hope is that in the long run, individually and all of us together, will contribute to some kind of a wider point of view. I have one other little thing I just found out that I, um, I had this talk put together, sort of put together. And I wanted to, you know, in the beginning I talked about Borden and the church in England and all that stuff. Well, I joined the National Geographic uh, Genome Project, and I, my sister and I sent in our DNA last month. All right, we, I, we scraped our cheeks, and I sent in, or I sent it in, and they traced my Y chromosome, which goes back through my father and all the males, all the way, all the way, all the way back. And I wanted to use that as a part of this talk. And my sister did the mitochondrial DNA, which was back through my mother and all the mothers all the way, all the way back. Well, I just got the results on Saturday. And I was going to, I didn't have time. They're too complicated to really to interpret all the things in there. But it was really, it's really interesting. I've got now, uh, has anybody else done this yet? Anybody here done this? It's really interesting. It shows all the um, mutations on my Y chromosome from my cheek last month all the way back through Europe and Asia and down through and down the Mediterranean and then down across and back and down into Africa 75,000 years ago, right? <laughs> They're all, and my sister's, which is the same mitochondria that I have, has the same thing from my mother's side. Her, my, mother's, my father's goes further east. It goes off through the Urals. But it's really, and I, there's all these markers, and I was going to try to put my talk around that. Didn't get to do it. Sorry. This is it. So final thought, this is something from Diane Ackerman, another one of the people I really enjoy reading. And I think this is probably the real motto. Um, what we want to do is use our education to make life worth living. Thank you. Thank you.